morning, church. Hopefully y'all are happy to be here because I don't know about you guys, but we are very blessed, are we not? And we got to be a blessing like they said this weekend, so that was really cool because if you noticed, that was part of our spiritual habits that we've been talking about. We got a little bit of that fellowshipping together, doing something together, but also it wasn't just about us. We were be able to share and serve other people right in the community. So that was also awesome, but they are correct. I am closing out this Holy Habit series. And it's actually kind of ironic because of what I'm doing today as part of the study and also the class, how it came about, is actually not the class that I chose. Um, This whole series has been class number two. And if you've been through class number two, it is me, Pastor Adrian, that goes over it. And it's basically the spiritual disciplines on how we grow and mature as Christians. And immediately when the four classes we had been talking about, I remember back in the days when we went to Rick Warren's conference, you know, it was obvious with Justin going to be doing the join class and all of the vision, and then Pastor David as he does best with all the ministries and serving and people and all their gifts and how he encourages, and then also Pastor Michelle with outreach and mission, and then there it was, lo and behold, the class about praying and Bible reading and all of the different things, and it ended up being me. And I think what's ironic about that, if you knew anything about me growing up, I was not, this was a process, y'all, because if you know anything about spiritual growth, it is a process. It is not automatic. It is not something that comes right away the moment you say yes to Jesus. And I was the girl that was afraid of praying. You asked me to pray in a group, and it was like, meh. You know, go ahead, go around me. I was afraid of talking. I was afraid of teaching. I was afraid of all the things. And people see me now, and I'm like, it is this. It is literally what we've been talking about the whole Holy Habit series. So that was good, and that's going to be a blessing. These whole series are a blessing. But I want to start off by telling you, I'm not sure if I'm going to go all preachy today, but really, this is like a class today, y'all. Um, I've been praying about it, and it's going to be more of a heart-to-heart and kind of a how-to mixed in. But I want to start by sharing with you guys my own blessing that I received this week. I know we talk about how we bless others, but I was blessed myself. And if you don't know and you weren't aware, this past Monday we had our restoration women's service. And it was amazing. There was about 61 ladies and we were so shocked because you ladies can keep a secret here, apparently. And their plan was to celebrate and surprise me, to honor me for my birthday, right? So, so many women gave, so many women gave um, words of encouragement. And so thank you guys. I never know everybody who was involved, but thank you, thank you, thank you. But it wasn't just a blessing because of that and what happened. What I want to tell you about is how this was like a cherry on top this past week for me. And so over the past few weeks, about three to four, there was actually something going on in my life that I had been dealing with very specifically. And something, it was a situation that I can't really go into depth about right now, at least at this time. And it was a situation that was happening, and it was actually happening week to week. And it wasn't like crazy horrible or anything like that. It was something that was starting to get into my mind. And, and I noticed it was almost starting to take root. But the thing was, is like, I teach this, I do this, I've grown up into this, and I know what to do. You know, I know about praying, I know how to worship, I know, you know, to come and serve others, get your mind off yourself and onto somebody else, and and how I've grown already, and and how to get into the Word. And and I remember because we were going over Philippians with the women's ministry, and and I was reading Philippians 4, and I'm like, all right, God, like, I know what to do. I'm going to do exactly what your Word says. I'm going to pray. I'm going to make some requests, leave it all to you, and I'm just going to start thanking you over these weeks, right? So every other day when stuff wasn't going as well, you know, like, thank you for everything you've done. Thank you for waking me up today. Thank you for my blood pressure not going crazy and all of the different things. And so I was just thanking the Lord, but I did have run requests for him. And it was very small. It wasn't even something like I was going all in and begging for every day. I basically told the Lord, I said, Lord, you know, you do what you do. You know, I love you, and I've seen you work, and I've seen you speak. I just need to know that you see me. I just need to know you're with me, and I just need to know you've called me. That's it. That's all I need. And so when I went about on my day and started thanking the Lord and doing all the things, well, sure enough, over these three weeks, it was kind of crazy how it happened. It was I was getting phone calls and texts from different people, and and these weren't even people that were active in the same, like, social circles, and I I would get one phone call, and they would say, you know, it was normally about, like, church business or questions, and they were like, Adrian, like, I have had this on my heart, and I really think the Lord wants you to know this, and I don't know if you've ever known from my mouth, but this, this, and this, right? And I would hear it, and I'm like, oh, okay. 
And then I would get a text and it would be the same thing. And it was like the same theme all over again. Like, hey, you know, trying to encourage you this week. You know, I hope you know, I appreciate this and, and this. And they would speak life in this specific certain manner. And then the women's service happened, and I'm like, okay, Jesus, <laughs> like, I see what you're doing. I get you. Like, I understand. But then it didn't end there, and there was another phone call in the middle of the week, and it was just normal things, church business, and, you know, saying, like, hey, so sorry we missed you. But then again, this woman had spoke, was like, hey, I don't know if, you know, we've mentioned or I've told you. And then she began speaking the very same thing. And it was all different people, men and women, like I said, different social circles, different times over the course of the week. But what I immediately and instinctively noticed, like, man, this is an only God moment. This is an only God type thing that he can do. He worked through different people. They didn't know. We didn't even have this as part of my conversation. I wasn't sharing like this was happening. And each person had the same message that was inspired from the Lord, and they all gave it like verbatim, literally. And by that phone call, I mean, I was literally on the phone like, oh, my God, like, yes, Lord, kind of, I hear you. And then God instinctively reminded me about youth camps. We were serving in youth ministry for a long time, a little over 15 years, and I got to be a part of their night lessons at youth camp. And so each year, there would be these big messages and themes for the kids. We'd pray about it. What's the topic? What are we teaching today? And then the different night teachers would be able to teach on their topic. And so we would all study, get in the word, and, you know, be in prayer and asking the Lord, what, what do you want us to talk about that night? What are we going to share? And sure enough, if you know uh, my husband and Pastor Aaron, we were normally in the lineup together during that season, and one was either in front or behind. And literally every year I've done it, one of us would either joke of like, thanks for teaching half my lesson. Like, thanks, dude. Like, what am I going to teach now? Or he would say, thanks a lot, Adrian. You know, what, what did you do that for? And kind of thing. But you could literally see God weave in the same theme, trying to speak to each and every student. And it was so cool to see the tangible work of God and his word over a specific set of people. And I don't know how many of you have ever experienced that. You've been in prayer here, you've received a word, and you're like, man, I thought that myself. And, and God is just speaking. And so as I was preparing this message, and the, the habit we are going over today is studying the Bible, is when it kind of hit me. And when you experience moments so tangible, and I started looking, and it hit me so clear, is, you know, we have this every day. We literally have the availability of having this happen to us every day, and we don't even notice it. Sometimes we take it for granted and miss it. And if you're wondering, like, how could I miss something like that, I would know it. Like, I would feel it. I'd feel the same phone call. I'd feel the hands laying on me. I'd feel that. Well, what I just spoke to you is just a tiny, just a fraction of the glimpse of what it took to get this together. The Bible together, y'all. Immediately, this took a miracle for this to be processed and put together. Literally, what I'm able to hold in my hand and what you probably have at home, and some of us have like four or five of them at home, this is a miracle right at your fingertips. And so here's the thing. If you don't understand the miracle this is, then you will never understand the value. And because you don't understand the value, you will never open it up for yourself. You will never open up these pages or, or maybe you're a little bit confused and you think like it's just a thing of to-dos or it's just old and irrelevant and what does this have to do with me and you'll never dare open it. And I remember when I was younger, you know, I've grown up in a Christian school, Christian church, been in church all my life, even started at a Spanish church, didn't know what they were talking about, and they would translate everything. And I remember hearing some of the adults, like, they were so on fire and hearing the message, but I would literally hear them say, like, they've never even opened the word. And that's shocking to me. But if we understood the miracle in this, so if you don't know anything about the Bible, that is what we're going to start. This is a miracle in how it's made. It is literally 66 books. Old Testament and New, and I know it looks like one solid book, but it's 66 put together, which means you have a library at your fingertips at any given moment. And not only that, it is written over a 1,500-year period. It is written over three different continents in three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. 
But not only that, it goes even a step further than what I even experienced in my own physical life. It was written by 40 different authors from all walks of life. Tent makers, peasants, kings, you have doctors, fishermen, and on and on and on it goes. And if you've been the Christian school route like I have, you learn that a lot of these books are categorized too, right? You have the book of prophecies, you have letters, poems, histories, biographies, and so much more, all in this one book. But here's the thing that I noticed, even just the miracle of just these past couple of weeks or that reminder, to get 40 people in a room to agree on something, y'all, is a miracle. Like literally a miracle. We'll be in trustee meetings, 12 people, youth meetings, whatever meeting, you name it. Everybody wants to have their own opinion. And even in psychology, when I used to study it, there's this thing called group think or eyewitness testimony where to get skewed. Something would happen in a room and all 12 people will see something different every time. But not here. Not with this. And so this shows you that from all walks of life, what God can do, they tell one unified story. And this is of who our God is, his redemptive love for us through Jesus Christ and how we can be more like him and that we can be part of this story. That is a miracle upon miracles. And I think sometimes if we don't get that and we don't understand it or maybe we're bored and we don't believe it or maybe we just think it is to do, like we just, we just leave it on a shelf. We leave it on a desk on a nightstand. Some of us buy a new one because we thought the other one wasn't as pretty in the right color and so we just get another one. But we never open up and realize like this is not just pages, like this is a miracle of God. And so if you have your Bible or Bible app or whatever it is, take notes. I like you to get back in scripture. We talk a lot about this in the women's in my class. John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Here's the thing, I would love to treat this as the greatest self-help book of all time. If you know me, you know I have a ginormous library at my house. I'm an avid lover of books, not just Kindle books. I love books, highlighters, pens, I'm a nerd. I love all this, but this is not the greatest self-help book. The Bible is a book about God. That is the point. In the Bible, it's his way of us getting to know him and his heart. That is what this is about. It's a getting to know him and his heart, how it reveals his character, who he is, what he does, what he doesn't do. And here's the thing, once you start realizing that, then you realize it's not about like this quantity thing. You realize you don't have to rush through it in a year or a month and skim right past it. But instead you realize I can take time and I can engage with the living God and he will engage back with me. That is what the Bible actually does. And then you lock in because you get it, because that's the point. It's not just about what I can get from God, it's about getting to know him. That is the main point of the Bible, y'all. It's not about reading it to see what blessing I can have or what he can do for me. It's literally the benefit of getting to know him. That is purely what it's about. And it reminds me of a lot how I fell in love with my husband. If you don't know this story, we do have a very long story, lots of restoration, lots of everything in between. But what he would like you to think when we first met, he would like you to assume it was love at first sight. He talks about how he looks and how good everything is, but that's not what it was at first, actually, between us, y'all, if I'm honest. It was not a love at first sight thing, but it was actually different. We were friends, we worked in ministry together, and I was a little bit cautious and timid. I'm an introvert, kind of a shy girl, and I made this kind of deal with the Lord, like I wasn't looking for that. By this time, I was all in with the Lord, like I was mission focused, like get out of my way. I'm not, I don't have time for dating kind of thing. And even we had best friends up front this morning, I'm like, some of our times alone was like surprise because they tricked us. <laughs> we thought we were going on a, a mutual group outing, and no, we were left alone kind of thing. But it was all of these dinners where I got to talk to him. We just got to share about dreams, values, stuff we were wanting to do in church and what we saw God do and, and what we wanted to do in the future. Because I was also secretly having a checklist in my head kind of thing too. And when we talked more and more and more, and as these dinners were progressing, it was like, oh my gosh, like 
I think I have feelings for this dude. Like, I don't want to like him. He was younger than me. I had rules. Like, I didn't date younger. Now he calls me his old lady kind of thing. But it, there was this thing, and it was like, I couldn't help with how much time I spent to see the person he was. I couldn't help but fall in love with him. Do you know that can happen through this? Do you know if you come into this place not really knowing God and knowing who he is and, and thinking you assume what he is or what he's done and maybe you come up here with some kind of hurt, whatever it is, we all got that same thing, right? Do you know that when you spend time with him, his heart will change yours towards him and you won't even know it? You'll be like, whoa, why am I feeling these certain ways? And so that's the coolest thing. Hebrews 4.12 says, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. You know, it penetrates even dividing your soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and it judges the thoughts and attitudes of your heart. The Bible is alive and active. It is not just an object to be set down. And what I mean is, is no matter when you study it or no matter when you read it, even if you think you don't really understand, each and every season, God will show you something different. You can study the book of Daniel three different times and learn more and newer things. And if you're sitting in here and you've been in your walk for 40 years and you think, I've moved past the Bible, like I've gotten way past that, you're wrong. This is a relationship that doesn't end. Like this is what it does. And so the Bible is alive and it's the thing that can make a direct impact in your life every time. It literally can change you in your life, you know? And sometimes it happens in ways we don't expect, right? So sometimes it will, you want this grand thing. Sometimes it's not. I'll be honest. I've opened the Bible and I'm like, hmm, what is this? Maybe just some knowledge for today on how the tribes were and, and how he's faithful in bitterness. And at other times, it's a way we don't expect because we're going in with our own hearts, with our own assumptions, thinking God's going to tell us we're right. We won that argument. We are justified in how we feel. And then we read in the story and God's like, no, you weren't. This is not about them. It's about you. And then he speaks and I was like, whoa. What are you doing touching that? Let's not touch that. So sometimes it comes not how we expect, but it's the only book that I know that can go straight to somebody's heart. It's the only book I know that knows exactly what you're thinking. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is God-breathed, and it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And if you know and been here at Restoration for any given amount of time, you know when we use the Bible, we mean to use it practically, which means we mean to apply it in life. We don't think the Bible is just about a story to read and, and knowledge to sound so big and words we don't understand. Like we know God means it for here and now, for us to do something with it. And that's exactly what the Bible does. It literally leads us. It can guide us when we don't know what we're doing. It can correct us. It does rebuke us, but it encourages us, it comforts us, it renews us, it can literally change our thoughts. Like it does all of these different things and yet sometimes it still gets a little dusty. And so here's the thing, here's the next point. The Bible isn't just meant to inform us, but transform us. That is what this Bible is meant to do. And if you come into this place and think it's the laying hands of a pastor, I'll know that is great, and I know miracles can happen. We are not God. Only God can be God. Only Jesus can do the changing. And that is exactly what this thing does. John 8, 31 through 32 says, and so it's Jesus, and he's talking to the Jews, and he says who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It's a great scripture. And I think everyone wants to be free at some time, right? Everybody comes in struggles. Everybody has problems and issues because we live in life. We live in a broken world. We all have our problems. We're all growing. We all have childhood experiences or whatever it is. It doesn't matter. I really don't care what it is. We all go through things, and we all want freedom. And for some of us, it looks like, hey, you know, I want to be free from my worry and stress. You know, I'm really worried about finances right now. I don't know how it's going, and how do I get this back together? Or I'm trying to figure out this whole parenting thing, and there's this next stage we're about to go through, and I'm not sure, and I'm, like, at my wit's end. Or maybe you're just dealing with anxiety, 
and you're just dealing with depression and you're even keeping it a secret, not showing, but you're seeing all these struggles that come out physically and you're like, I just don't know. I keep trying things and decompressions and, and meditations and all these other things and it's just not working with this Band-Aid. And maybe some of us are even trying to figure out work and deadlines and stress. I've been there. I've got a lot of stuff going. And here's the thing is we want to be set free and God already gave us the answer what it is to be set free. He literally said, if you abide in my word, not only will you know the truth, it will set you free. Not maybe, not hopefully, not good luck to you, you know, do this much in it and then you'll get it kind of thing. He said, abide in my word. This is where freedom is. And yet sometimes we go past it. But you know what abide actually means? When you look at the word abide, it means to continue, to remain, to be present, to even endure. Meaning like it's not always when it's convenient. It's not always when we have time or not tired for it. Like we've got to endure and keep coming back so that we can stay in his word. Because that's pretty hard. If you heard like Pastor Justin spoke last week about prayer, you can do this at other times. It doesn't have to look a certain way and be so legalistic. It only has to be this or it only has to be from that kind of thing. But we can. You know, a lot of times I think we settle just for a moment in an hour in his word. And I find myself, that is kind of like how my life started. We settle for a moment. And we settle for an hour. And maybe you're like, Pastor Adrian, what do you mean by that? And well, I honestly mean it. And I know our weeks get busy. I'm right there with you. It's like God kind of teaches me this over and over. That's why it's so ironic I got this class, because this is the class I had to overcome, and I had to work, and I had to process through, and I had to fight for this, fight to grow. And so we all get busy. We all get stressed. We all have moments where, man, I just want to go home and chill. I've been on the computer all day. We've been doing church work, and it's like, I don't want to read. (laughs) Like, I don't want to do these certain things. So I understand that. But I think sometimes we let all these reasons become excuses, And then we never do what we need to do. And so week after week, we come into these Sunday mornings. And each pastor, and I'm not downplaying how great the series are, right? Because they're all great. I hear it all the time. We get to hear testimonies of people where you're learning, you love this series. A lot of people are like, man, it spoke right to me, or man, I'm feeling this challenge, and, and man, I should go forgive and love or go serve. And like, I feel Pastor David talking, and I can feel it. I'm not sure about it, but we can feel God moving, right? And so I'm not downplaying that they are not good and they are not, you know, an okay thing to keep us. But here's the thing. I like to think about it like a meal. And so the pastors are preparing this like food, right? And so they give it to us. They're doing all the work, prepping, I'm prepping. We're doing it. And you get to, you get to savor and you get to digest. We can't all this time force you to pick up the fork and go do it, right? We can't force you to do anything. But here's the thing, on Sunday mornings after the message, especially after a service like this, it's right near lunch, I can always tell on people's faces when I'm getting too close to 45 minutes or 50. Everybody's looking, everybody's getting hangry, everybody's thinking, where should we eat? And everybody's playing after church, because y'all talk a long time, everybody's out there, we're like, come on, like, we're ready, it's two. And everybody's always talking about, like, what's good to eat? Like, I'm hungry. Like, we want to eat a lot, because some of us have served for many hours. But here's the thing, I can guarantee you, nobody in this room, when you plan, of, okay, what's tasty? My husband's always going to say Mexican. I'll, I'll go any which way. He's always going to say Mexican. And you're like, man, this is delicious, and we always eat big. We are not dainty people. We eat a lot of food. And when we eat this, we never plan, I'm sure you never plan, that this is the only meal for the week. We never say, like, man, I'm so full. Like, we're just going to eat out next Sunday. We're good for the week. No groceries. I'm sure if we did that, like, I'd have a lot more money in our bank account. <laughs> like, we'd have a lot more money. Some of us, my husband jokes, you know, trying to get, you know, fit there, getting back to the gym. Like, some of us wouldn't have issues of the up and down weight or whatever it is. Like, physically, for our, our appetite, we never consider skipping all these meals. Like, we've even talked about fasting before in the church, and you bring up fasting, and everybody's like, no, don't fast. Definitely not the 21-day fast. And it's like, no. And why? Why do people not like to skip a meal? Because everybody knows we get hangry. Everybody gets hangry. And I don't know about you, but I know some people who get hangry, hangry, and people get grumpy. They get snippy. They get all of these different things. And if you're like my husband, he won't skip. Like, I can miss a day for work. 
I can deal with it and push through. My husband, he don't need a clock. He don't need a phone. He don't need a watch. As soon as mealtime comes, his stomach's going. He's like, where are we going to eat? When are we going to eat at work? What are we going to do? Who wants Mexican? Or where are we going to eat breakfast? Like, he's immediately knowing, like, he don't even want to wait. But then if you go so long without eating, like, you literally can't think straight. You're really getting stiffy, and you die. Like, literally, you die without food. And so the funny thing about this is, is knowing we're not even willing to go out with food and snacks. We're not willing to miss all these meals, even sometimes for a fast. But then why do we settle just for what the pastor preaches on a Sunday and go back home and let ourselves starve spiritually? Why do we do that? And so here's the thing. Here's the next guarantee I'm going to give you, and it's a note so that you don't forget. When you don't get into God's word and digest it for yourself consistently, then you will see the effects in your life spiritually. So the same way we have physical pains from not eating is the same way we will have those spiritual pains too. And you won't think straight. And you want to be grumpy with the person next to you. And maybe you want to be feisty and a little angry and not forgive and maybe pick a fight. I've done that before. You know, it's kind of doing this with me. Watch out if I'm like on a week of stress and I haven't been with the Lord kind of thing. And maybe we're just letting certain stuff go that we wouldn't if we would have spent time with him. So why do we do that? But here's the thing is, honestly, I do find it funny that God gave me this class and even this message. When we were going to do this message, it was down to the last two. And I had my husband switch me on a week because it fell during the women's. And it was between prayer and Bible study. We always get together, pray, talk about what the Lord, you know, what does he want to share with his people? And we knew there were certain subjects that we knew we had to go over. And so prayer and Bible study was left. And it was like, mm, like this is one of the ones that I, I had to grow through. And I remember my husband, like, you can take either one. And, and I'm like, Who, what did God speak to you, hoping that he would choose for me? And then sure enough, I was like, I'm choosing this one. I know it could be the boring one. I always joke in my class. My husband always says his is the cool, fun class, and they get to me. And then they get excited again for Pastor David and gifts and stirrings. But immediately I knew why, because I've been where you've been. This is literally how I started. And in fact, it is something that I had to grow on my own. And in my late teen years, about 17, 18 years old, it was just this. Like I said, I've grown up in church, grown up in a Christian school, done all the things, had good people in my life. But the thing was, is once God saved me, and I don't have time to go into that story, re-saved me and dedicated my life, I was like all in for God. Like I was all in, in church. And back then, youth group was like twice a week. And so I was in church like three or four days, not even working there at the time. And so I was at like every service doing all the things. And God just kept nudging me and nudging my heart. And he was like doing the same thing that it talks about in Hebrews of like, okay, honey, like Adrian, you've been fed. Like I'm spoon feeding you and you're getting all this milk, but now it's time for the meat. And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> like, I love the message, and I just cheer and take notes. Like, I take notes, y'all. And so, and God was like, no, like, I just want you and me. Like, this is time for you and me. And so he'd keep nudging. But the weird thing that I noticed I had to start fighting was I had these weird, like, little thoughts that would come in of, like, no, you can't do this. Like, why, why even try? Because I was blessed at our founding church from a founding pastor who was amazing and had amazing revelations, on fire, running the pews kind of thing. And I used to think, like, he got that from in here? Like, what in the world? And so I had this fear, and I was intimidated by the Bible. I was like, I, there's no way I can get that from there. Like, how am I going to do this? And then I started having this fear of, like, what if I get in this and nothing happens? What if I start reading this and I don't feel or see anything? Like, what does that say about me and my relationship? Like, all of these thoughts, it's not like anybody was telling me this. It was a literal thought. At that time, I didn't know where it came from. After I got in there, I learned. But it was all these thoughts that were stopping me, and I'm like, why? What am I doing? And so I knew all of these things, and over and over, God started pushing me. And I know it sounds weird, but here was the thing. He wanted me to learn how to have a quiet time with him. It wasn't just about studying the Bible for ministry or Sunday school or youth ministry. He used to even tell me when I almost tried to make it that, he's like, no, that doesn't count. That's like work and ministry you're doing. That has, that's not me and you. And so God started just pushing like, 
now, like constantly, all the time, and I'm so thankful, how to have this quiet time, just at me and Jesus. But you know what changed the game for me? Completely and entirely. It was no longer a checklist. It was no longer a thing to do. It was no longer, I even talk about that in class when we did it in a women's series. This is not a checklist. This is how we live life. This is how to live life well. And so that was the thing, is God started showing me that this is a relationship. And not just any relationship, this was my relationship. This wasn't the pastor's relationship. This wasn't my youth pastor's relationship. This wasn't my family's relationship when I grew up with them. My faith wasn't going to be their faith. They didn't carry me anymore. This was my relationship and my relationship alone. And so that's what God started showing me. But like any relationship, it takes time and effort and investment to be intentional about it. In our marriage, if I chose never to hang out, we didn't have any date nights with my husband. And, you know, we have to fight for those things, especially now, 17 years married, almost 18 years. And if we don't do that, we would be so cold and distant. And that's what God was wanting is like, that is all I'm wanting. I'm not trying to give you the list. That'll come. I'm just trying to show you I love you. I'm just trying to show you I want you. It is just me and him. And so the question I'm always asked every, this is part of the growth track of what we talk about, is how do we do it? What does this look like? And I'm going to tell you right now, there is no magic formula. There is no perfect way. There is no one way. I always tell people to get that out of your minds. That that is going to set you up for failure. The point is, is it's a relationship and it's about spending time together. It's about falling in love with the God of the world who took time to not only create the world, but to save the world because he loved us so much. And that is what it's about. And so I tell people, just ignore all of that. We have to take time with the same way we would do a spouse or a partner, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever you want to look at as the same way. So step one is you got to plan for your time with God. That's always step one. Just like I said with my husband, we got to plan dates. If we don't plan it and calendar it, our dates don't happen. And if I don't have time with my husband one-on-one to talk with him, to share with him, we don't stay close. I don't feel like we know what each other's saying. Like We could go a whole month without a date if we're not careful. Same thing can happen with our God. If we aren't careful, we can go a month just settling for a Sunday lunch. And so here's the thing is you do that. And it can look different at times. And so the most important thing about this is you have to choose a consistent time and place to meet with God alone and undistracted. Alone and undistracted. Community group doesn't fall into this. Sunday mornings doesn't fall into this. It's the alone time, your relationship time. And so it looks different. In college, I went from work to school to ministry, work, school, ministry, sleep, work, school, ministry, sleep. So you know where my quiet time was? At that time, a little pocket Bible devotional, it was in my car. I was traveling back and forth to SAC and UTSA. The only time I had time alone was literally in my car. And so sometimes I wanted to take a nap. (laughs) Jesus like, no, you have a good hour. Let's do this kind of thing. And so I would read. Sometimes not sure. I would start with the devotional because I'm like, I don't even know how to do this. You'd be surprised growing up in a Christian school, not learning how to have a quiet time. And so that's what it started. As a stay-at-home mom, it started changing. My quiet time was on a recliner. It was literally with my son. It wasn't as quiet. I had to learn. Back then, he was crawling and moving and touching and marking all on things. I had to be okay with that and still choose to take that time with the Lord. I'm telling you, this is when things shifted, was during my stay at home. So it was like my early 20s. And this is when I chose to start using this by itself and saying, okay, God, let's, let's do this thing, do what you want. Now, if you were to fast forward now, now it's kind of shifted because of basketball season. My quiet times would have to be at five in the morning or a 4.30 a.m. wake up call. And for, if you're like me, I am not a morning person. I hate mornings with a passion, and I snooze five times. But if I want to get alone before the world wakes up, before my husband and son and two dogs and everybody is running in the house, I have to get up before dawn. And so that's what it looks like. So that's what we have to do. Step two is you've got to position yourself to hear from God. You've got to position yourself, and what do I mean by that? I mean we've got to let God in. We have to pray. We can pray before, not just after. And say, God, I don't want this just to be about my human mind. I want you to speak. Holy Spirit, shine a light. Show me because I know what I'm reading. And I know how long ago it was written. Like, I need your help. 
And sometimes we can make it too much just about learning what's up in here and focus on the logo software, Blue Letter Bible, Bible Gateway, every commentary, and we just leave God out of the thing. And he's the one that wrote it to begin with. So we got to remember not only to position in prayer, but also come in eager. That's what we talk. We got to expect God is going to talk to us back. We got to expect we're going to hear from him. Step three, pick the passage and begin meditating on it. This can look any different way. Like I said, for some of us, it is a devotional because we need help. We need help how to look into this. What can we see? What can we read and be encouraged by? For others of us, it is studying a book of the Bible. It's figuring out where do we want to start. Sometimes it's a topic. Sometimes it's a character. And sometimes, a lot of times for me, especially in my 20s that I do now, instead of just randomly picking, I can no longer, like I did in my younger years, Lord, show me where to do and just point and pick kind of thing. Then it's like, oh, the dog vomited it out of his mouth kind of thing. Like, no. Sometimes I'll pray and ask, like, God, you know what's going on in my life. Show me which book. I don't even know. Like, show me. And he will. And the things he speaks in those moments, like, I wouldn't trade it. That, that is some of the best advice. Pastors have great advice. My friends have had great advice. But this was life-changing advice. And so here's the thing. So you meditate on it means you don't have to rush through it. Let it soak. Let it saturate. Think on it. Let it just kind of remain in there with you. Don't rush past it. I mean, that would be a horrible date if you rushed on through. In and out, 10, 15 minutes, bye, see you later kind of thing. I don't want to do that with my husband. I want hours. Like, we don't want to go back home. Like, let Josiah wake up the next morning. He's fine. He's 14. Like, we don't have to rush these things. So here's the next thing, step four. You can pull out observations. What spiritual principles stand out to you? And this is where you get to ask all the questions. This is where my nerdy side comes out. I was a school nerd, have a big library. I love pens, colored pens, highlighters. I'm a big advocate. I say it all the time in class. Mark this thing up. You can ask all the questions and look into it. And this is where you ask the important things like, who is this about? Who wrote it? When was it? This is all about context. What was happening? The where's. But then you go further in and you ask yourself, what, it, what are you trying to show me, God? What are you doing here? What is his character being revealed? What is he doing? What is he not doing? Even more, you can use like the spec plan. You can do S's for sin. What sin is there? Is there a promise to claim? Is there an example to follow? Is there a command or a directive to know? Or is there something to know about God? So there's all these different things that when you take time, verses will come alive before your eyes that you will understand and know what God is trying to speak. Step five is plan how to apply it to your life. And this was game changing for me. You see, because in James 1, through 25, it actually says, you know, we're not just supposed to be hearers, but we're supposed to be doers. I've said that a lot in the women's. I swear I've said this like in the last three messages. We don't just hear, we do. And it literally says in this scripture that if you're like the person who goes and looks himself in the mirror and then you immediately go away, you forget what you look like. And when you forget what you look like, whoever looks intently into the perfect law gives freedom to them and they continue in it. So you'll forget. If you don't do it immediately, you forget. It's not like this whole riding a bike, I did it 100 years ago, you're still going to fall. Like, you have to keep doing it. And that is what changed my life, actually, in my 20s when I did the soap. I did the soap method, and it was scripture, observation, application, and prayer. But part of the application was actually making a plan. Y'all, how many of us make a plan for everything else in life? We want to financially plan, figure out retirement, 401ks. We want to have a fitness plan. How do I diet, lose weight for me, get healthy, watch my heart, blood pressure was shooting up. We want to plan for work and deadlines and school and kids and all of the things. But yet when God speaks something here in a service or God starts speaking to us in here, we make no plans. We just go by the wind and hope it works. Like, that is not what God wants us to do. And when I was doing these soap methods, like, I literally had to sit there. And I have journals till this day, especially in my 20s. I have, like, journals upon journals. And during that A portion, it was like, okay, God was showing me something. Okay, this is what I'm going to do at work. I would literally write it out. Okay, I need to go back, go talk to this person, try to apologize. Okay, I don't even need to speak back. David didn't speak back. Joseph didn't speak back. He let God fight for him. And so it was like these little steps I would see in the story. And I would write it out. And so it would make me remember. Nobody knew what I was doing or going on. And then I would try to step that out in my own life. And so that's what we got to do. So this is what I want to close with, guys. 
You heard Pastor Justin's message, and hopefully you were here for Pastor Justin's message last week about prayer. And really listen to the whole Holy Habit series. Get online if you haven't heard it yet. But it says, when we pray, we talk to God. We have all the time in the world. We do a lot of talking sometimes. But when we study the Bible and we get into the Word of God, He talks to us. We have to get available and let Him talk to us. And the thing I'm asked a lot, especially now at this age, one of the biggest questions I always have is, how do you hear God? I don't understand, Adrian. How do you hear it? Some people know me as like a prophetic prayer person. I'll go pray over you, and it'll be the exact thing you were talking to the Lord about. And it's because, you know, I know and hear his voice. And everybody likes to use the scripture and say, well, my sheep hear my voice. I was saved. Like, I know it. No, you don't. You know why the sheep knew the voice of the, the shepherd? proximity because they were close they could even josiah i could be somewhere in the mall and he would immediately recognize my voice because he's so used to hearing me speak and that is what this is about like the only thing i could answer people was like it is not this special miracle laying hands of moment like it's all of this it was all of these times in this, in the word, and in prayer that I got to learn how God speaks, how he moves, what he says to me. And it was like, if you want that, then you got to do this. And the thing was, is I had to come to realize this book is not just any book. He died so I could have this book. He literally died, sent his son, shed his blood, was tortured, bruised, mocked, humiliated, just so I could have a relationship with him. And not just any relationship where we says yes and we all both go our ways, but so that we could have a relationship every day. So that I could know the love of a father as close as I know the love of my husband. As easily as I can tangibly feel him, know his voice, know what his hug is, I can know that with my God, and I do, y'all. And it's because I had to learn to fight to grow with God. I had to learn. And then there were benefits with getting to know him and to know his love. There were benefits of getting to be with him. And that's what people always ask. Well, how did you stop the depression, y'all? How did you stop the voices? Because anybody who knows my story knows I used to hear voices. I used to hear things. And as embarrassing as that is, it is what I claim now. Like, it is this. It is this truth. It was not a special lane of hands. It was not a medicine. It was not a counselor. It was constantly going back to this and saying, okay, God, I know what I'm hearing. I know what I'm fighting, but I'm going to keep believing. And you keep talking, and I'm going to keep listening. And to be 43 years old, Doing what I do in this church is a miracle. But it's only because of God and knowing my God and to know that this word was alive and active in me. And if he can do it in me, he sure enough can do it in you. And it doesn't matter what you come in here with. Literally anything, even literally of fighting through a marriage, of keeping a marriage going, it is his word. It changes you. It renews you. It comforts you. And so this is what I want to get across to you, guys. This is, this is a relationship. This is really not me coming up and giving you a list of to-dos. You can choose to do it or not. I can't force you. We can't force feed you. But how fun is it to sit and watch somebody eat a meal? If I were to go to my husband and watch him eat the meal and just sit there and and never take a piece of it. Never experience what it's like. And y'all, I can say, I'm not perfect at it. And there are seasons, and, and I know the band's going to come up and start playing right now, because this is what I'm going to close with. Guys, the God that I've known and the God that I love, this is a God I would live and die for. And I remember at 17 years old, reading a story in a book called Jesus Freak, this, if you, it's not a word book, y'all. It was uh, from a DC talk group, a famous song that they did, and it was from a Fox's Book of Martyrs. And I realized, man, like something had to change within me. Because I remember reading the story of a 17-year-old girl. 
And at the time, I forget which country she was in, and they were telling the story of the soldiers coming in, and the soldiers were having everybody deny, because there was a Bible in the house. And they were all asking, like, whose Bible is this? Deny right now, and they had their guns up. And literally, the adults, one by one, was like, that's not ours. We don't serve, we don't do that, blah, blah, blah. But then a 17-year-old girl picked up the Bible, ran to pick up the Bible, held it close, and said, this is mine. This is my Bible. This is my God. And all I could think was like, I want that. What, what is the difference? Because you can either be the Christian that leaves it on a desk, that leaves it on the nightstand for however long. I've been there. I've done that. Or you can be the one that says, this is my God. I would live and die for this. And I know I've heard several times over and over, like, you do too much in the church, you were overextending, blah, 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 this and that. Yes, I know there's balance, but that is how I choose to live my life. I will live and die for this because I know what he did for me through this. That is how important it should be. But here's the even bigger thing. I have seasons just like y'all. Soap was one of the best things when I journaled because then I realized when I missed, I thought it was three days and it was like a week. You know what God did each time? He didn't come and kick me down and like, you should have been doing this and talk ugly. I don't know how God talks to you. That's not how he talks to me. But what he normally tells me, and usually that's really what gets me, every single time he always says, I miss you. I miss you. That's it. And I can feel it. It's almost like I have this impression. I can hear him. I miss you. And then I'll go back, do work, get to another conference, and then I can hear him again. And it's like, I miss you. I miss the one-on-one. -on -one. Like, I miss you and me. And that's it. That's what this is about. That's what this is all about. It's about relationship. It always comes down to our relationship with our God. And so maybe that's where you are today. And if you are, that's okay. And in fact, I will make you a promise. If you've come into this church and you were like, I have never even had a Bible, we will pay for your Bible. Come to us. Come up front. Let us know. That is how strongly we believe in the Word of God. And that's how strongly we believe in the entire Word of God. We will get you a Bible. Or maybe you've come into this place and you've been a Christian for a lot of your life, and you're like, I've never even opened it up. I've just been spoon-fed my whole life. I don't want you to keep missing out. <laughs> because if I could explain to you the many times God has talked and moved, and even the things that I just talked to you about earlier, that was only because of stuff he did in the quiet time that I could see him much clearer on the outside. And maybe you're like, I need to get back. Like, I miss this, and for whatever reason, whether it's big or not, and whether it was justified or not, and you're like, maybe I just need to get back and make a new commitment. So come down here. Don't waste your time. Come down here and tell God, like, God, I, I want this. Like, I want to make a new commitment. I want to do this. I'm even going to buy a new Bible, y'all. I've been fighting it. Like, my Bible is falling apart. It's missing Genesis. But I have so many notes in it. And I'm like, sorry, I had to be honest because um, I lent it out. I have so many notes, and I was so torn. And you know what God told me a couple of weeks ago? We'll start over, and I'll give you more. He can give you more. So then make that commitment with me and join me and say, okay, we're going to do this thing again. We are going to have this quiet time relationship, and it's just me and you. And God, speak what you want to speak or even don't, and we'll just hang out. That is what it should be. But what's more important for me today is not just what's going to happen right now, and I do encourage you guys, don't be embarrassed. This is not a church of shame. We all talk about our stuff. I'm very happy to tell you where I've come from or even what I'm struggling with now because I know there is freedom with him. But what's more important is what do you do tomorrow? What are you going to do Tuesday? What are you going to do Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, say, Saturday? And what I tell my class every time, and it's part of one of our little notes, I think note five, it's a whole long section, y'all. What I always say is even if you mess up, even if you miss a day or a week, don't ever, ever give up. Keep going. 
So I'm going to ask you guys to stand with me, and we're going to pray right now. And so I'm going to ask you guys just to bow your heads and just really consider in your heart of maybe I should come forward, maybe I should do this and make a commitment, or maybe I just need to talk to God and ask the Holy Spirit to show me. Like, I don't even know if I'm doing this thing right. So I'm going to ask you guys, dear Heavenly Father, we just humbly come before you today, Jesus. Lord, I thank you. Because we know it starts with relationship first, God. And there's not one person in this place that you didn't love and die for. And so we thank you that you made this divine appointment today, that they may think it was accident, they may think it was invitation, but it was a specific invite from you to say, come and find me. And God, so we thank you that we have available your word (laughs) from your mouth that you care so much to go through, so much to do it over continents, over people, over time. People literally died for this, and you brought it here to us. And so, God, we thank you for that. And I just pray right now, Lord Jesus, that that seed is planted in this heart right now, that we would know in our bones. And instead, I pray that we feel that drawing from you. That this is not about shame to stay away. This is not about how have I messed up. But instead of saying, it's time, I miss you. And so God, I pray that we are drawn to our knees, but not just an emotional moment, something that sticks, something that's rooted, so we can be the trees you have called us to be, that do not wither in season, but instead we are carried by your name and we are carried by your power, Lord. And so we praise and we thank you because I know through each and every person, each and every book, no matter the age, eight years old to 88, Lord God, that you can speak. Speak into our lives specifically so that we can walk in a new way, so that we can gain freedoms we've never had, so that we can be a witness to show the world that you are real. And so God, we thank you because it may seem simple with just a book, but it is the most life-changing thing in this world and so god we just thank you and so we pray lord god that you would anoint our minds give us wisdom give us conviction give us intention but not only that lord for those of us who are like me who are intimidated and scared and kind of stepped into it very slowly god i just pray you speak in a way that you shock them that you would speak truth, that you would open up their eyes to see you, not just on a page, but out in their life, that they can see you everywhere that they begin looking, God, and that there would be fruit from this growing relationship, that we would have a desire to continue to be growing because you are so worth it, Lord. And so we just praise and we thank you for that, Lord God, and we thank you so much for a second chance. We thank you for a second chance to do this over again with you and that you never give up on us. So we will never give up on you. In your name, we praise and thank you, Jesus, because your name is the one and only a name above any and all names. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.